All right, so we are looking at page 313, section 5-1. Page 313, section 5-1. All right, if you'll notice, chapter 5 marks the beginning of integrals. We're making a, a big shift here. The calculus that we study in AP Calculus is really two different branches of calculus. It is derivative calculus, or differential calculus, and integral calculus that deals with integration. Um, we'll find out that differentiation and integration are actually inverses of each other when we get to 5.3, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. But the nice thing is, at this stage, at Chapter 5, it's like we're starting all over again with a clean slate. Remember when you first started derivatives? Okay, In the very beginning, it was a little challenging because you had to learn the definition of a derivative, and you had to learn how to do derivatives the long way. But then we got those cool little shortcuts, and life was really good, and calculus was really easy. And then it just built and built and built and built until Chapter 4. Starting all over again, Chapter 5, Clean Slate, with a different branch of calculus. So we're going to look at the definition of integration and the long way of doing this for a couple of days, but then we'll get shortcuts again. So um, it's kind of like we're starting over. All right, eventually we will learn that integration is finding the area under a curve. If you want to find the area of a figure, uh, like let's say you were trying to find the area of this figure right here, what we've learned to do in the past is to divide that figure into separate figures that then we could find the area of each of those pieces and add them together, right? So we would go through and divide this into triangles, or if it was a different type figure, we might divide it into rectangles or trapezoids or circles or something else, and then find the area of those figures and then sum up those areas to give us the area of our complete figure. So if I'm trying to find the area under this curve, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take that figure and I'm going to divide it up into other figures that I know how to find the area of. And the first type of figure that we're going to use in section 5.1 is a rectangle. So you'll notice in example number 1, over on page 314, it says use rectangles to estimate the area under the parabola y is equal to x squared from 0 to 1. So we're looking for the parabolic region s that is underneath this curve. Okay, So they suggest to me in example number one that I start by using four rectangles. So if I'm going to break this up into four rectangles, I could go through and say, okay, I'm starting at zero and I'm stopping at one. If I divide that into four equal pieces, each of them is going to be one-fourth long, right? So my first rectangle would go from zero to one-fourth. My second one would go from one-fourth to one-half. My third one would go from one-half to three-fourths. And my last one would go from three-fourths to one. I could write those as sub-intervals of that overall interval from zero to one. So again, that first rectangle went from zero to one-fourth. I could write that as a sub-interval zero to one-fourth. And then the next one went one-fourth to one-half, one-half to three-fourths, and three-fourths to one. So that's where we get those sub-intervals up there. Now, some notation that they're going to use is that n is going to be the number of subintervals that I have. So, like, that's the number of rectangles. They told me to use four rectangles. a is going to be my starting point, and we're also going to call that x sub 0, like the original x value. b is going to be my stopping point, and we're going to call that x sub n. So, for instance, if I had four rectangles, that would be x sub 4. That would be, like, my stopping point. So if I come over here and I look at what we had right here, we used common sense to figure out that each of these was one-fourth unit long, but they give me a formula for ch finding the change in x. They say that change in x can be b minus a divided by n. So in essence, that's your starting point, I'm sorry, your stopping point minus your starting point divided by the number of subintervals that you want to have. So, again, common sense, but that gives us a formula for finding that one-fourth, all right? So, for our first interval, we started at zero, so that would be x sub zero. And then the next value that we have was one-fourth, so that'll be x sub one. The next value is one-half, so that'll be x sub two. The next value is three-fourths, that'll be x sub three. And then the last value was one, that would be x sub four. And notice if we've done this correctly, 
that our stopping point should be x sub n. n was 4 here, and so sure enough, we've got x sub 4. So that's how we could label this. All right, we are going to find the area under the curve, or at least an approximation of the area under the curve, two different ways. We're going to use what they call right-hand endpoints, and we're going to use left-hand endpoints. What do they mean by that? Well, let's start with right-hand endpoints. When I'm working with right-hand endpoints, I'm going to go through and find this area by doing the base of the rectangle times the height of the rectangle. The base of the rectangle is pretty obvious. In every single one of these, the base is just my change in x, right? 1 fourth minus 0 is 1 fourth. 1 half minus 1 fourth is 1 fourth. 3 fourths minus 1 half, 1 fourth. 1 minus 3 fourths, 1 fourth. The base is just the change in x. But where do I get my height? Something has to determine the height of that rectangle. So that's what they suggest to me over here for my right endpoints. They say, let the right hand endpoint set the height of your rectangle. So when I'm looking at this first subinterval, 0 to 1 fourth, I'm going to use the value on the right hand side. That 1 fourth, I'm going to look at if I took that x value and traced it straight up until it hit that curve, that will set the height of that rectangle. Same thing for this next one, for 1 fourth to 1 half, I'm going to use the right hand side, trace that x value straight up, and that will set the height of that rectangle. So that's what we mean by right hand endpoints. Another way to look at that is if you come up here and you look at these subintervals, we are using the values on the right hand side in each subinterval to plug in as the x value to set our height. So we're going to use 1 fourth, and then we're going to use 1 half, and then we're going to use 3 fourths, and then we're going to use 1. All right, what do we mean by set the height? Well, we said, for instance, when I want to find the area of this first rectangle, we said it would be base times height, and we said the base would be the change in x. That's that 1 fourth right there. But if I want to find the height, if I want to find the y value that goes along with it, I need to take that x value of 1 fourth and plug it into my equation to figure out what y is. So I would plug in the x value of 1 fourth, and I would say 1 fourth squared. Same idea here. When I'm looking at the second rectangle and I'm trying to figure out its area, its base would be the change in x, and its height would be by taking the x value of the right-hand side, whether you get it right here 1 half, or whether you get it right here from the right-hand side of the interval 1 half. I'm going to take that 1 half and plug it into that function to figure out what y is. So I'm going to take the 1 half and plug it in to figure out what 1 half squared is, what my y is. Okay? So again, you're taking the right hand side, the 1 fourth, 1 half, 3 fourths, 1, or the right hand up here, 1 fourth, 1 half, 3 fourths, 1, and that tells you what values to plug in down here, 1 fourth, 1 half, 3 fourths, 1. So this is the area of my first rectangle. This is the area of the second, area of the third, area of the fourth, just by doing base times height. I'm going to sum up those four areas, and that would give me an approximation of the area under the curve. Now, if you'll notice, this approximation is going to be really high. And the reason for that is look at all this overhang, like right here, right here, right here, right here. When I calculated this area, I included all of that overhang that was not under the curve. And I'm just looking for the area under the curve, so this is going to be a high estimate. All right, what if I did left endpoints? Well, let's come over here and look at the same scenario using left-hand endpoints. If I let the left-hand endpoint set the area, I'm sorry, set the height. So, for instance, look at this one right here from 1 fourth to 1 half. If I let the left-hand endpoint, 1 fourth, set the height of this rectangle, I'm going to take 1 fourth and trace it straight up and see where it hits the curve, and that will be the height of my rectangle. So I would go through and say, okay, for the first rectangle, if I'm trying to find the area of this one, the base is, of course, the change in x, 1 fourth, but the height is going to come from taking the left-hand endpoint of 0 and plugging it into this equation for x to find y. So that would just be plugging in 0 squared. If I want to find the area of the second rectangle, base is going to be the change in x, 1 fourth, Height is going to come from taking the left-hand endpoint, x value of 1 fourth, and plugging it into this equation to find the y value, so we would do 1 fourth squared. If I want the area of the third rectangle, left-hand side tells me to plug in 1 half, so I'll plug in 1 half squared to get the y value to get that height. If I'm looking at this last rectangle, left-hand value tells me to use 3 fourths. 
I could get it from the rectangle or I could get it from my intervals up here. Because again, if I look at these subintervals, what's on the left hand side is 0, 1 fourth, 1 half, 3 fourths. So plug in 0, 1 fourth, 1 half, 3 fourths. Okay? So you can get it from the actual drawing or you can get it from your subintervals. So this is the area of the first one plus the area of the second one plus the area of the third one plus the area of the fourth one gives me an approximation of the area under the curve. But if you'll notice, this approximation is going to be really low. Because look what happened. I left off part of the area under the curve. Like none of these pieces was added in. So I'm not finding the full area under the curve. I'm missing pieces of it. So that's going to be a low estimate. So what I know is that the actual area under the curve is probably going to be somewhere between those two values that I just got. One thing they suggest to me is that I could do an average of those two values. Literally a mean, add them up and divide by two. And what I come up with would be a better approximation than either of those other two. So if I actually calculated the exact area under this curve, it would be one third. And so you'll notice this isn't, you know, it's not too bad of an approximation. We're off by, um, you know, one one hundredth. But I'm not accurate to three decimal places, which is what AP requires. So can you think of any way that we can make this more accurate? Smaller intervals, which means we would need more rectangles, right? Because the problem is I have so much overhang and so much underhang. If I came over here in any one of these rectangles, if it were divided in half, I wouldn't have nearly as much overhang. And so that's what they show me there on page 314 in the textbook. They do what we just did with left and right endpoints. But then if you look over at page 315, they go back through. And this time there in figure 6, they use 8 rectangles. And look how much better of an approximation that is. You don't have nearly as much overhang and underhang. And if you'll notice, the actual areas that they find there are much better approximations. They also give you a table there on page 315 that would show you what if we did 10 rectangles or 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 or 1,000. No, we're not going to sit here and actually calculate out 1,000 areas and add them up. That would be ridiculous. But if we did, look at how good of an approximation we would get. We're from the left-hand side and from the right-hand side. We're right at that value. All right, then they show you that over on page 316. Like on the bottom of 316, they give you some drawings that show you, okay, what if we use 10 rectangles? What if we use 30? What if we use 50? And you'll notice that you get a much better approximation every time because you can see there's much less overhang every time. Over on the top of 317, they give you what if you had 10 rectangles, 30 rectangles, and 50 rectangles using left-hand endpoints. You still have an underhang, but it's nearly, not nearly what we had before as well. All right. So from that, we can make an assumption that you see over on page 318. It's actually the formula that we're going to use for the area of a curve. So based on those charts that we were just looking at, we get the idea that the more rectangles we have, the better our approximation is for finding the exact value under the curve. If we could come up with an infinite number of rectangles, then we could find the exact area under the curve. And that's going to be our definition. The exact area under the curve will be the limit as n approaches infinity for either that right hand or that left hand sum that we were just doing. And that actual value would be one third. So the definitions that they give us there on page 318 say this. If you wanted to find the exact value of the area under the curve, you would do the limit as the number of subintervals or rectangles approached infinity for r sub n or l sub n. Now, if I'm using r sub n, remember that the first value that I'm going to plug in is not x sub 0. The first value that I plug in is that right hand endpoint, so it's x sub 1. And when I finish, I stop with the last value, my stopping point x sub n. However, when we were using left-hand endpoints, we did start with the actual starting point x sub 0, 
but we did not use the last stopping point. We used the value right in front of that. So let's see how that matches up with another example. Uh, let's look at um, example um, number four from the homework. So over on page 322, example number four says estimate the area under the graph of f of x is equal to 25 minus x squared from x equals 0 to x equals 5 using five approximating rectangles and right endpoints. Sketch the graph in the rectangles, figure out if it's an underestimate or overestimate, and then for b, repeat the same thing with left endpoints. Okay, so they told me that they want me to use the interval from x equals 0 to x equals 5. So I know that A is going to be 0, B is going to be 5, and they've told me to use 5 rectangles. So how do I find my change in X? What was our formula for that? B minus A over N, right. Stopping point minus starting point divided by the number of subintervals, the number of rectangles. We could use common sense for that as well, right, and figure out that each one of them is going to be one unit long. So where's my first interval going to start? Zero, and it's going to go from zero to one, right? So we're going to go from zero to one, and then one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to five. So what's x sub zero? What's x sub zero? Right, -hand side. right, it's always our starting point, right? So it's zero, and then x sub one is the next value, one. x sub two is the next value, two. X sub, two, uh, x sub 3 is the next value, 3, x sub 4, x sub 5, and remember if we've done it correctly, then this should be the same thing as x sub n, the number of subintervals we're going to have, and we did have 5 subintervals, so we know we're correct. And again, if we look back up and match this up with the formula, again it makes sense as to why this one starts with x sub 1 and this one starts with x sub 0. Because if I look at this first interval, the right-hand endpoint is 1. That's x sub 1. That's why this says for the first value use x sub 1, not x sub 0. Same thing if I'm looking at the definition of the left hand. That left-hand endpoint is 0. That is x sub 0. So that's why that's the first value I put in. Look at the end of it as well because the end of it is different. When I'm using right-hand endpoints, if you look at this last subinterval, the right-hand endpoint is 5. It is x sub n. But if I'm using left-hand endpoints, the left-hand endpoint is 4. It's not x sub n. It's x sub n minus 1. It's the next to the last value. Okay? So again, that makes sense when we match it up with the intervals or the formulas. Either one tells us the same thing. Now, if we were calculating the actual area under the curve, we could use this area formula. and We could say area is the limit as n approaches infinity of r sub n. So that would be the limit as n approaches infinity, and this is our formula for r sub n. Now, I know that we're only using five subintervals, so we're not going to get an actual area. We're just going to get an approximation. But the only reason I copied this down here was so you could see where we're getting this formula right here. It's coming from that r sub n definition that they gave us higher up on the page. Okay, so let's fill in what we know. We know that when we're using right-hand endpoints, we're going to start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, those values on the right. Or you could use the definition that tells you do x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub 4, x sub 5. So that's what we've done as well, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub 4, x sub 5. So whether you look at the subinterval and you pull out the right-hand value, or whether you look at the definition and you pull out the values that we've identified, either one's going to give you the same thing. We also need change of x. Now, I write my definition a little bit different. If you look up here at r sub n, do you see how they've done change in x, change in x, change in x for every single one of them? Why multiply every single term by change in x if you could just factor it out and multiply by it one time, right? That'd save us a lot of time and energy, right? So that's how I've written mine. I've pulled the change in x out in front. We've already determined that change in x is 1, so I'm going to replace change in x with 1, and I'll just have to multiply by it at the very end. All right, when I want to find f of 1, that literally means take 1 and put it in the place of x in the function. So let's come up here, and if we put 1 in the place of x in our function, what would we get? 24, 24 right. Then we're going to take 2 and plug it in. So 2 squared would be 4. 25 minus 4 gives us 21. 
Then we're going to take 3 and plug it in. So 3 squared is 9. 25 minus 9, exactly 16. Plug in 4, plug in 5, and we've got it. And so our right estimate is 70. If we had an infinite number, we could say that this is an actual area. We don't. We just have five subintervals, so this is just going to be an estimate. The next thing that they asked me for was to sketch a graph so I could figure out, is this an overestimate or is it an underestimate? Just because it comes from the right doesn't automatically mean it's going to be one or the other. I have to look at it. It really depends on whether my function is increasing or decreasing. Last time we had an increasing function. This time we have a decreasing function, so it's going to be different. So if I'm looking at my decreasing function, 25 minus x squared, we know that's a parabola that opens down, right? So if we're looking at the piece of it from 0 to 5, that's going to be a decreasing function. If I go through and in this first interval from 0 to 1, if I use the right-hand side to set that height, it's going to be an underestimate. Look at the piece from 1 to 2. If I trace that value of 2 straight up and where it hits the graph, I set the height of the rectangle by that, it is an underestimate. So yes, last time right-hand endpoints was an overestimate because it was an increasing function. Here it's an underestimate because it's a decreasing function. So it won't always be the same thing. I need to look at it and see what I'm working with. All right, let's do the B part of this then and let's do the left-hand endpoints. If I were going to do left-hand endpoints, by the definition that we had, it was the limit as n approaches infinity of L sub n. So L sub n was the change in x times f of x sub 0, f of x sub 1, f of x sub 2, f of x sub 3, f of x sub 4 for what we've got here. So again, I know that we're not doing an infinite number. We're not finding the actual area. The only reason I've written it this way is so we could get that L sub n from our formula up here. So we are just finding an estimate with five rectangles. Okay? So we could go through, and again, if you want to look at your rectangles, you could say, okay, the left hand values in these subintervals are 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. That would tell you what to put in down here 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. The other thing that you could do is you could use the formula. In the formula, it says start with x sub 0 and stop with the next to last value. So I would start with x sub 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and I would stop with 4. I wouldn't go to that last value. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So again, whether you use the intervals and pull off the left-hand side or you use the definition. Can I have your attention, please? Next period class. <coughs> P.E. and health go to the old gym. Art go to the media center. Thank you. Okay. So if we go through and we plug in our change in x, we've already established up here that our change in x is 1. So if we plug in our change in x, which is 1, and then we can go through and find f of 0. If I put 0 in the place of this x right here, what am I going to get? 25, right. That's the only value we haven't found yet. The rest of them, f, sub one, f of 1 we already found was 24. f of 2 we already found was 21. f of 3 we already found was 16. f of 4 we already found was 9. And again, we can see how this was the underestimate and this was the overestimate. We could take an average of the two if we wanted to to get an approximation. So we've already said that one way to get a better estimate would be to make more rectangles. Not really a big fan of making a thousand rectangles and finding each of their areas. Can you think of any other way that we could do this that might give us a better estimate? Eventually we will do intervals, yes. Do we have to use the left end point or the right point? Would there be a better value to use? The midpoint. If I used the midpoint for this thing, look how much better it would be. Like, look at this interval right here. This is that same first problem that we did where we had y is equal to x squared, and we were going from 0 to 1, and we had four subintervals, right? So each of them was one fourth long. Here are those same four subintervals that we had on our very first example where we got the really high estimate and the really low estimate. Look how much better it is, like on this interval from one-fourth to one-half. 
If instead of choosing the left-hand endpoint or the right-hand endpoint to set the height, if we choose the midpoint and we trace it straight up to where it hits the curve and we let that, we let that set the height, you're going to have a little bit of overhang and you're going to have a little bit of underhang and they'll somewhat balance each other out. So that should, in theory, give us a better estimate, right? Well, let's check and see. If I want to use midpoint to find the average, the first thing I need to do is go through and find the midpoint of each of my intervals. So I could say, okay, what's halfway between 0 and 1 fourth? Literally add them up and divide by 2 and you get 1 eighth. What's halfway between 1 fourth and 1 half? Add them up, divide by 2, you get 3 eighths. Add these and divide by 2, 5 eighths. Add these, divide by 2, 7 eighths. Something that might be a little bit of a shortcut there, we already know that our change in x is 1 fourth from when we did this before. So once you find your first one, if you add 1 fourth to that, you get the second one, add 1 fourth, add 1 fourth. That might be another way that'd be a little faster and easier because I can say, okay, 1 fourth is 2 eighths. So if I have 1 eighth and I add 2 eighths, that's 3 eighths, add 2 eighths, that's 5 eighths, add 2 eighths, that's 7 eighths, instead of finding four different midpoints, whatever you want to do. So if I'm going to calculate the area of each of these rectangles, I'm going to do the base, which is the change in x, 1 fourth, times the height, and the height comes from taking the midpoint and plugging it in for x into the equation to find the y value. One more time, if I want to find the area of this first rectangle right here, I'm going to do base times height. Base is the change in x. Height is taking the midpoint as my x value and plugging it into that function to find the y value. So I'm going to go through then and I'm going to plug in each of my midpoints into the function to find the y value, to find the height of each of my rectangles. And once again, like we've already seen, instead of multiplying by the change in x every single time, I'm just going to pull it out in front and multiply by it once to save myself a little bit of time and energy. All right, so if I plug those in, like if I take 1 eighth and I plug it into this function, 1 eighth squared is going to give me 1 over 64. 3 8 squared, 9 over 64. 5 8 squared, 25 over 64. 7 8 squared, 49 over 64. I can find the sum of those, multiply it by 1 fourth, and I've got the approximate area under the curve. Look at that approximation. We've already said the actual area under the curve is 1 third point 3 repeating. I am only off by 5 one thousandths, and I didn't use 100 rectangles. I used Four. Midpoint is a significantly better way of approximating than either left or right. Okay, so let's sum this up a little bit. If I wanted to have a formula then for midpoint, I could write it very similar to the ones that we wrote for left and right. I could say that the actual area under the curve is going to be the limit as the number of subintervals approaches infinity for the midpoint. So that means that I need the limit as n approaches infinity of f of x sub 1 times the change in x. And remember this little bar typically represents mean, add them up and divide by 2. So that's what they're using to symbolize midpoint. So this would be the midpoint of the first interval plugged in to find the y value times the change in x and so forth until I got to the end. So here's how I could generalize all three formulas that we've seen today. Left endpoints, right endpoints, and midpoints. I can say the area is going to be equal to the limit as n approaches infinity. So if I had an infinite number of rectangles or subintervals, where I have f of x sub 1 times the change in x plus f of x sub 2 times the change in x all the way down to the last one. So this is like the area of the first rectangle plus the area of the second one all the way down to the area of the last one. This little asterisk right here they tell me in the book represents any value that I want in that subinterval. It could be the left endpoint, it could be the right endpoint, it could be the midpoint. Whatever value that I want to choose from that subinterval. If we look at it that way, then we could use summation notation to simplify that even further. We could say, all right, let's have f of x sub i times the change in x, where we start by plugging in 1, i is equal to 1, and we stop when we get to n. 